So this will be made available afterwards if you have to, if you'd like to watch it again. So um, just before we get started, I wanted to go over some uh, housekeeping items. You're probably all very familiar with Zoom, but in case you're not, we are currently in a Zoom webinar, which is a little bit different from a regular Zoom meeting. You can all see us, uh, me, Dan Bokenfor, and Dan Weber, um, but uh, we cannot see you. Um, you're the, the audience in this case, and you do not have camera access, but you have, however, you have the option to speak. And so for the Q&A section at the end, if you'd like, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you and you can ask your question. Alternatively, there's also the Q&A box if you want to type in questions there at any time. We will go over those at the, very, um, at the end afterwards as well. Uh, like some of you have had uh, used already, there is the, uh, the chat box. So if you've got anything that you want to put in there, you can. As a reminder, if you choose the option, uh, please choose the option to everyone. If you want to go, if you want your message to go to the group or to a specific person, if you don't want it to go to the whole group. So we're just gonna get started here. Um, many of you probably know, my name is Kendra Wombold. I'm the Communications and Media Specialist here at the Greater Parkland Regional Chamber of Commerce. And we're so excited to have you all here today. And we're very grateful for McLennan Ross to be um, with us here today to host another webinar. So let me introduce our two presenters. Um, Dan Bokenfor is a litigator and advisor to union and non-union employees on labor, employment, workers' compensation, occupational health and safety, and administrative law issues. Dan represents and advises employers concerning a variety of workplace issues, such as termination, discipline, human rights, employment standards, workers' comp, and occupational health and safety matters. He also advises employers on various dismissal issues, including establishing just cause to dismiss, reasonable severance pay, and strategies to avoid wrongful dismissal actions. We also have another Dan, Dan Weber, uh, Dan provides pr um, strategic legal advice in the areas of labor, employment, litigation, procurement, and insurance law. He brings experience in all stages of litigation and has represented clients in trials before the Court of Queen's Bench of Alberta and the Provincial Court of Alberta. Dan also has experience representing clients before a multitude of administrative bodies, including arbitration panels at, and the Federal Public Sector Labor Relations and Employment Board. Alberta Labor Relations Board, Workers' Comp Board, Dispute Resolution Decision Review Board, Body, Appeals Commission, Alberta Human Rights Commission, Employment Standards Program Delivery, and the Security, or sorry, the Social Security Tribunal of Canada. So Dan and Dan, I will now pass this over to you and uh, take, take it away. All right, thank you Kendra for the wonderful introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, on our webinar about Bill 32, uh, which the government has chosen to call res uh, Restoring Balance in Alberta's Workplaces Act 2020. That's the name they came up with. Uh, but what it's all about is making changes to uh, Alberta's Employment Standards Code uh, and making changes to uh, Alberta's Labor Relations Code and uh, other labor legislation governing the uh, public service. So um, our webinar is going to be, it's scheduled for 90 minutes. If we can get you out of here a bit early, we will. Um, if there's questions that come up, feel free to send them in and uh, Dan and I will follow up uh, with you and do our best to answer those questions. Uh, we're both, uh, uh, as Kendra said, uh, lawyers in uh, uh, the McLennan Ross office in Edmonton, specializing in labor and employment. Uh, so this is an area of the law that we've had to uh, uh, get ourselves familiar with, uh, and we're happy to, to share some of the updates with you on this legislation. Uh, in terms of what we'll cover today, um, uh, we'll cover, uh, we'll go through the changes to the Employment Standards Code first, uh, and then we'll cover the changes to the Labor Relations uh, Code. As you'll see from the slide, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, public service uh, sector labor relations uh, acts that are changed as well. We won't be delving into those. We'll be focusing on the uh, on the first two acts that are amended by this legislation. And uh, as the name of the legislation suggests, uh, the aim of the government here was to uh, add some flexibility uh, back to labor relations for employers 
cut red tape uh, and try and make it uh, easier for employers to be nimble and to um, you know, really react uh, to some challenging times that we're facing right now. And uh, as with any change in government, the pendulum tends to swing one way or another. When we had the NDP government in, um, uh, changes were made which were more uh, on whole, uh, could be described more as uh, union friendly or employee friendly. Uh, and this government now has tried to swing the pendulum back a bit and introduce uh, some things that are a little more friendly for employers. Um, so uh, with that introduction out of the way, I'll turn it over to Dan to jump right in. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Kendra, for the introduction. Um, we're going to start with Employment Standards Code uh, updates. Uh, I should mention, Dan and I have tried to make, the, make this as difficult as possible, so we will be jumping back and forth and try to stay on cue. Uh, to add to the difficulty level, and I apologize if I have to run off screen, I do have a three-year-old that I'm tending to, and I have bribed him, I have peed him, I have fed him. He's in front of the screen, so it should be good, but he, he may yell and need me to duck out, so I do apologize uh, for that. Um, so as I said, we're going to start with the Employment Standards Code, um, and as Dan indicated, these changes that we're going to go through uh, are generally employer-friendly and kind of swing that pendulum back to the employment, uh, employment side. Um, if we can go to the next slide, Dan. Uh, I believe Dan did the, the similar presentation early on when the bill was introduced, um, and so uh, jumping off from, from where Dan and Tom Ross of our Calgary office presented on, um, some parts of the legislation took effect uh, August 15, and those parts are the layoffs, group termination, and uh, director of ministerial variance provisions, while other um, parts of the, uh, the amendments, the updates, took effect November 1st. So this is a fairly timely uh, presentation in terms of all the changes, but in particular those uh, November 1 changes, and, and those changes are to averaging agreements, or arrangements I should say, because we're now using a different term, so averaging arrangements. Uh, timeline for payment of earnings on termination, which is, I think is really, really a good point, uh, a good change made. Uh, deductions from earnings, that's also uh, effective November 1st. Hours of work and rest periods and uh, holiday pay calculations. So a lot of changes are very recent, but we're fairly timely in, in regards to all the changes that have been ushered in. Um, jumping ahead to layoffs. So um, layoffs is something that we've dealt with a lot in the COVID-19 pandemic, not only because business having to be shut down because of restrictions, but also just a, a poor economy. And so this has been the culmination of, uh, of a lot of things that have led to a lot of our time early on in the pandemic advising uh, employers of how to address uh, layoffs. And under the former regime, uh, the period of layoff, the temporary period of layoff was 60 days within a 120 day period, which wasn't very long. And so what we see now is an amendment to the layoff provisions. Um, so now we see the maximum period of layoff is 120 days within a, sorry, a 90 days within a 120 day period. So we have effectively another month. Um, however, if we're dealing with COVID related layoffs, then we have uh, the period remains at 180 consecutive days. So that's important to note. Um, It's also important to, to note that you can have a temporary layoff period longer if it's under a collective agreement. So um, the, the main thrust of the change is applied to regular employer employee situations. However, if you're in a unionized environment and you have a collective agreement, you can effectively contract out of some of the layoff provisions under the code. All right, thanks, Dan. And another thing with the layoffs is prior to all of these changes coming into place, including the regulations uh, specifically addressing COVID, it was this concept of a rolling uh, layoff where if you had any you know, layoff periods that added up to the 90 days, you would trigger a layoff. And uh, that no longer applies in, in our COVID era, which is uh, important because with shutdowns and so forth, you may have to lay employees off for a few weeks and then bring them back. And uh, you have no control over whether um, uh, future changes like that are necessary again. So that's some added flexibility right there that is really helpful with uh, COVID. Moving on to group terminations. This is a uh, section of the Employment Standards Code that um, 
employers hope they never have to deal with. It's only going to apply to large employers who have to terminate uh, 50 or more employees uh, at one time. And by one time, I mean uh, within a four week period. That's the measuring stick that's used under the legislation. So um, years ago, uh, this legislation or this part of the legislation has been around for a long time. Originally, it was just a, a requirement to give notice to the minister uh, if you're terminating more than 50 employees. And uh, when the NDP government made changes, what they did was they did a couple of things. One, they made it a sliding scale. Um, you know, if you were terminating 50 plus employees, you needed to give eight weeks notice. Uh, the more employees you were terminating, the more notice you needed to give um, up to 16 weeks if you were terminating more than 300 employees. Um, the second thing they did was they said you need to give this notice not only to the minister, you need to give it to the union if there is one and you need to give it to employees. And, um, and then they tied that into the notice of notice of termination requirements for employees. So uh, you had this compounding of, of notice obligations to employees because you uh, had this notice uh, plus the the notice under section 56 of the code. Uh, so if this notice happened to be longer, uh, employees got the benefit of that. So it, it did add to the financial burden of, of terminations. Um, the UPC government has gone back to the old system. Um, so they've taken away uh, the sliding scale and they've taken away the notice requirements uh, to the union and to employees. So the bottom line is that now these enhanced uh, you know, termination requirements don't uh, impact uh, the termination pay that would be owed to employees at the end of the day. Um, so that's a, a important change given the tough times that employers are facing these days. Uh, so it, it's a bit of relief on that front. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the old, the way this works is still the same and that it's not going to apply uh, on, to seasonal employees. So if so if you hire um, employees for the season or for fixed terms, um, if that type of hire is clear that it's going to end at the end of the season or at a fixed date or at the end of a project, uh, then, you know, these provisions wouldn't apply. Um, moving on to payment of earnings upon termination. Yeah, I should mention just with the seasonal, there's no magic words, but you're going to want to indicate on any sort of offer letter that it is seasonal. So us lawyers, when eventually you are sued or, or there's a complaint, we can, we can have something to glom onto and point and say, hey, it was clear, abundantly clear at the outset of the employment relationship that it was a seasonal employment. And then fixed term, there, there's actually some specific requirements that you're going to want to have, but that's a, that's a discussion for another date. Um, moving to payment of earnings upon termination. This is a, a really good change because practically speaking under the old regime, and this predates our previous government, uh, when you terminated someone, you have to provide their earnings within either three or 10 days of employment. And oftentimes, um, as a lot of you may know, payroll is not flexible. Uh, they're a rigid beast. And, and depending on what mechanism you had, we'd, we would have uh, our employees, or pardon me, our clients, our employer clients come to us and say, we can't actually make payment. And, you know, then we try to cajole them into cutting a check and, and going through all sorts of steps. So I've used a lot of words to say, basically this update, it creates a new, uh, a new regime for when you have to pay earnings, which include termination pay under the definition. And now uh, the employer can choose when to provide uh, uh, the, the final payment. And that could be within 10 consecutive days after the end of the pay period in which the person's terminated or 31 consecutive days after the last day of employment. So this, effectively allows the employer uh, time to get their, get their balls in a row um, and on the next pay period, make that final payment of earnings, which will include wages and which includes termination pay or statutory uh, pay. So it, it's really helpful. Uh, we'll definitely reduce the amount of calls we have on this, but at the end of the day, that's a good thing um, that employers can, can meet their statutory requirements and don't have to spend money on legal fees trying to figure out how to address it and what happens if they're not able to meet that that requirement. All right, thanks, Dan. 
Uh, the next thing we want to talk about briefly is deductions from earnings. Uh, this is another change that is um, very helpful from a practical perspective for employers. Um, this situation doesn't arise too often, but um, from time to time, there's mistakes that are made in paying employees and those sort of things. And this change makes it easier for uh, employers to rectify that situation. Uh, Section 12 of the Employment Standards Code has fairly rigid restrictions on when an employer can uh, make deductions from an employee's pay. Um, the typical examples are if there's a court order or something clear like that. So you think of a garnishee summons or something like that that you're served with. The other, I'd say, broad category of exemption is with the employee's written consent. So you can always, if they agree that the money's owing to them, they can always authorize, uh, give you an authorization in writing to deduct that amount from their pay. But outside that, you don't have much flexibility or you didn't. Um, so uh, these changes are aimed at sort of uh, addressing payroll errors and those types of things. If an honest mistake has been made and it, and it, it could be shown that the employee was overpaid, well then the, the employee shouldn't be able to hold the employer hostage and say, you know, I'm not giving you authorization to deduct those amounts. So um, this legislation allows you to go back six months. So if, if you've made an overpayment within the last six months, uh, you can go ahead and, and set out a deduction from the employee's pay to get that back. If it's a large one, you may still want to be reasonable with the employee and set out how you're going to do it over a number of different pay periods. Um, and the same thing can apply if you're dealing with uh, paying out too much vacation pay to an employee. So those sort of mistakes can now be rectified. The only obligation is that you give the employee written notice of what you're uh, intending to do before you do it. The other restriction is, is that the uh, these changes came into effect on November 1. So we're talking about overpayments that have occurred uh, after that date. Uh, and you've really got six months to do it. If you make an overpayment and try and come back, you know, nine months, 12 months later, you're going to need the employee's authorization to deduct that pay, or you're going to have to go um, and maybe even if they're not cooperating, commence an action to get that money back. Um, but this should make uh, it much easier to rectify those sorts of simple payroll errors. Dan, over to you and uh, averaging arrangements. And just taking a step back, I think that change also just lessens the, the chance of conflict between an employee and employer. So another point where there what might have been an issue or an uncomfortable discuss discussion uh, is now fixed. So I think that's just a good change. Um, now going to averaging agreements arrangements. So uh, one of the significant modifications to the code is the change of averaging agreements to averaging ar arrangements. And, and from earlier in the, in the presentation, you see that I'm still trying to get my head around the proper termination, uh, terminology that is. Uh, averaging arrangements are now similar to the compressed work weeks that applied before the concept of averaging agreements was introduced in the 2017-2018 uh, code amendments. Um, of note, uh, so what the, what the changes have ushered in is employee agreement is no longer required to place employees on an averaging arrangement, though the arrangement must still be in writing. An employer can require work under an averaging arrangement prior to employment commencing. So they can have it implemented and they can tell the person before they've, uh, they've commenced employment that it's going to be applied, or uh, if uh, they, can, they can let them know that there's going to be an averaging arrangement on two weeks notice. The uh, averaging agreement in terms of required parts of it uh, must specify the work schedule and the daily and weekly hours. Uh, however, it's going to be a lot easier under this regime, under the averaging arrangements, to modify uh, schedules. Um, and so within that averaging arrangement, it of course, must specify the manner of amending the schedule and give notice when required. Uh, and something I'll, I'll talk about just a, in, a, in a little bit is the, that averaging arrangements can also specify how overtime entitlements are calculated. Uh, carrying on, the new averaging period under averaging arrangements has been increased uh, to 52 weeks from the uh, very short 12 weeks. So you can take someone's total hours over a whole year and figure out if they're entitled to overtime as opposed to the, the 12 week maximum under the former regime. Um, and now there's a, a six month right of complaint uh, 
uh, for non-compliance with averaging arrangements. Um, there has been also amendments, not just to the Act in terms of averaging arrangements, but we see amendments to the regulation, um, and specifically those talk about how uh, overtime is to be calculated. So now we know through the regulations, through the changes to the regulations, that um, the employer can ignore daily overtime hours and, sp and strictly look and see how much an employee has worked on average above 44 hours per week, and that would be the entitlement. So that's a really key, uh, and I'll just reinforce by saying you no longer need to look at average daily hours, you can look at average weekly hours, and that, that'll be a, quite the boon for, for some employers. Um, so this has been a welcome change because we saw uh, that these averaging agreements under the former regime were quite cumbersome, difficult to, to change, and at the, end the, at, the, at the end of the day, pardon me, weren't a tool that employers felt comfortable using or could use, um, and so we've seen uh, a change and we, we hope that these are implemented because they will save employers money um, and they, they will be a lot easier to use and, and modify as required. All right, thanks, thanks Dan. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a, a critical change for employers, particularly in these times when you've got unpredictable uh, fluctuations in workload and need to adapt. This gives you a lot more freedom to, uh, to make those sort of changes and work out arrangements that uh, make sense for your business if need be and to uh, sort of change on the fly as you need to. So um, next, uh, we just want to talk about some of the, the added flexibility that's been built in to the legislation around hours of work and rest periods. Um, and this is, um, you know, similar flexibility as we were just talking about. Um, but the main change here is that uh, there's certain uh, mandatory restrictions under the code when it comes to maximum hours of work, uh, you know, 12 hours, unless there is a unforeseen or unpreventable circumstance like an accident that requires you to go over. There's strict uh, requirements around days of rest. You need to have one day off per week or two every two weeks or, and so on. Uh, and the maximum you can work is 24 straight days before you need four days of rest. Um, there's strict requirements on the notice required for shift changes. Um, you know, uh, you need to give uh, appropriate notice of that and you need to have at least eight hours of rest between shifts and so forth. Uh, what these changes are designed to do uh, with respect to that is to give sophisticated parties, uh, employers and bargaining agents, uh, the ability to work out their own terms that make sense for their operation. So employers in a unionized world can now uh, meet with the union and enter into a collective agreement or a letter of understanding to deal with these sort of things. And in those circumstances, you can go um, outside those parameters of the code. Um, the other changes that relate to rest periods are just sort of a tweak to, to how it works. Um, the, the concept is, is that an, an employer, if you're gonna have an employee scheduled for more than five hours, you're gonna have to give them a 30 minute rest period. And if you're going to have them at work for longer than, or 10 or 10 hours or longer, they're gonna need two 30 minute rest periods and that uh, can be paid or unpaid. Um, and there's just some more flexibility around that for employers now um, in terms of how they schedule it and they can work it out with the employee. They can break it into 15 minute increments. And if the employees are not agreeable to a certain way of doing it, the employer can ultimately dictate uh, when those breaks are to, to happen. So um, just uh, cutting through some of the um, cumbersome a uh, way of uh, organizing those breaks. If if your employees aren't being cooperative, you can uh, make a decision at the end of the day as to how the how how those breaks are to be taken. All right, uh, holiday pay, Dan. Um, what can we say about that? I wish I had some holiday pay now. <laughs> in the oncoming holiday season. Um, well, not much to say, just give an update that the definition of average daily wage uh, used for calculating holiday pay has been removed. Holiday pay will now be calculated by averaging the employee's total wages in one of two periods the employer chooses over the number of days worked. So again, uh, that's at the employer's election um, and it would 
ultimately behoove the employer to sit down, you know, the accountant or the accounting department or someone who's good at numbers and figure out what uh, what period best serves them. But the key, key takeaway is that the definition is now no longer there, where it was five percent of earnings or some uh, other other set of language, and now you have two different periods in which you can look at to figure out what is holiday pay and, and how much is owing. So another benefit for employers. All right, thanks, Dan. The, the last thing regarding the Employment Standards Code uh, that we wanna talk about, the last major change uh, deals with variances. So a variance is where an employer or a group of employers um, decides that they need some relief, they need a they need a, an exception to one of the specific rules under the code, um, or they need to vary it somehow uh, for a particular project or for uh, their operations. And uh, it under the old regime, uh, under the legislation that was introduced in 2017, um, it was quite restrictive as to how you go about it. Now there's two different approval processes. You can apply to the employment standards director in some cases, and you can apply to the uh, minister or responsible uh, for labor and employment in other circumstances. And previously employers could only apply to the director and the director could only vary certain things under the act. And otherwise it was only groups of employers uh, who could apply to the minister for other types of changes. So now that's sort of been uh, opened up. Uh, employers, groups of employers, employers associations can apply to the director. Uh, all of those groups of uh, employers can, uh, or categories of employers can apply to ministers as well. Uh, and they can really um, ask for variances on all sorts of things. Um, like the types of things we've been talking about already, uh, maximum hours of work in a day, uh, maximum days of rest for a shift cycle, um, those types of things. Um, so uh, if you find yourself in those situations, uh, now you can rest assured that the process should be a little bit easier to navigate and should be uh, e easier at the end of the day to get that type of variance if you can um, uh, Make, a, make the case as to uh, why it's needed uh, and also make sure that you're able to, to justify that uh, uh, you're not putting employees at risk in terms of safety or, or that sort of thing with what you're proposing. All right, uh, yeah. that is uh, the employment standards uh, code in, in a quick overview. Uh, now we'll turn to the labor relations code. Yeah. I'll take this opportunity to give our firm a plug and Dan a plug in terms of any things that falls under the Employment Standards Code, including the variances. And Dan spoke about safety. And so our firm obviously is well known for its labor and employment background. So we have a lot of experience drafting variances under the new regime. And we'll definitely rely on that experience to draft variance requests under the current regime. So if you do find yourself with a square peg in a circle hole in terms of your business, you can definitely uh, come to us and we can help you draft the appropriate correspondence to try to get you the variance or, or any address any other issue under the Employment Standards Code and the Labor Relations Code. So with that, I'll, I'll pivot to Labor Relations Code. Um, and again, what we see is the pendulum swinging back to an employer or management friendly uh, amendments under the code. Uh, and, the, and unlike the Employment uh, Standards Code and the amendments came in kind of at a piecemeal fashion um, in August, November. The majority of the changes under the uh, Labor Relations Code were effective on um, July 29th, 2020, which is the date that the bill uh, received rural assent. Um, however, there are some changes uh, that are going to come into force on proclamation, which we expect to happen uh, in 2021. Uh, those changes that are not in force currently and that will come uh, into force upon proclamation include uh, the requirement for unions to provide financial statements to its members, uh, notices by unions to its membership to provide, uh, to explain how they allocate union dues and their, the ability for members to opt out of the use of union dues for non-core functions. Think of the use of non, uh, union dues for political endeavors. You can now opt out and that'll come uh, through a, a proclamation. 
uh, changes to when collective agreements uh, can be renewed uh, and the, the closure of certain open periods, and Dan will speak to that I think a little bit later. Um, issues addressing secondary picketing, so restrictions on secondary picketing, the, that will come in a uh, proclamation. Uh, the standard of review for the board in terms of when it reviews arbitral decisions, uh, we're still waiting for that to come into force. Uh, issues dealing with construction bargaining units and construction project agreements, um, although they have been passed, again, those uh, changes don't come into force until uh, proclamation. All right, thanks, Dan. When it, one of the changes that uh, the government introduced early was uh, a change to the certification process. So when a union um, applies to the board to represent a group of employees, uh, there's a process that they have to go through. Um, part of that process requires them to file some evidence with the board to show that uh, as an initial litmus test uh, that they've got a you know, uh, support from a fair number of employees uh, within the employer's operation that want that union to represent them. Um, and that can be by way of petition or it can be uh, by way of uh, union membership cards. So the latter we call a um, a card-based certification application. Back and under the old uh, regime, uh, under uh, NDP changes that were introduced in 2017, um, uh, unions in certain circumstances be, could become certified by the Labor Relations Board as the exclusive bargaining agent for uh, a group of employees without there being a um, certification vote. And uh, that occurred if they had filed enough uh, membership cards uh, to demonstrate that they had 65% of the group of employees that they were applying for. So um, out of concern that uh, there's not a lot of control as to how those cards are uh, signed and uh, there's no line of sight to what is said or done to sort of procure signatures on those union cards. Um, uh, and give and to sort of preserve the concept that um, unionization should be a democratic process where uh, unions are voted in and out based on secret ballot votes. Um, the UPC government uh, reintroduced the, re the requirement that there be a certification vote. In every case, uh, if the union presents a petition that 90% of the employees they ask for uh, want to be certified or union cards of 90% of the people, they still have to have a vote. Um, and the and the board looks into a number of other things. They, they make sure that the unit of employees applied for is appropriate for collective bargaining and some other things. And then if they're satisfied of all of that, they order a vote, they supervise a vote and uh, it's, a democratic process. Uh, if the union uh, gets uh, more than 50% of the people that come out to vote, um, if those people vote in favor of the union, then the, the union becomes certified. So that general process has been restored in every single case now. More recently, what the government has done is they've um, given more flexibility to the board in terms of the timelines that it has to process these applications. So. Um, the labor board is is quite busy at the best of times, never mind in the midst of uh, COVID while they're trying to do everything in large part remotely. Um, so one of the problems they were up against was uh, again introduced in 2017 uh, were a, a series of, of rigid timelines where once they got an application from a union, they had to process it within certain days. They had to make decisions on whether there should be a vote within certain timelines. There had to be a vote uh, again within uh, very you know, very short timelines of a few weeks, uh, which may, which wasn't always easy to do. So now there's more of a flexible approach where that can be uh, extended as needed in order to make sure that these things are, these applications are pro processed appropriately. Um, the other thing that uh, the recent changes will do is that they will extend um, sort of the cooling off period that happens after a failed attempt to become certified. So if a union applies to become certified and they ultimately 
either withdraw their application or it's dismissed by the Labor Relations Board, then um, there's a cooling off period, which was traditionally three months where the union can't apply, make the same application or one that's uh, reasonably similar to it uh, for, for 90 days. Now that cooling off period has been extended to six months, uh, which is designed to encourage uh, unions uh, to be uh, sure about their level of support before they're making applications and to really provide stability in the workplace. It's quite disruptive to go through uh, uh, an organizing campaign and a certification application and to be doing it sort of on a continual basis is, is, is not helpful at all for employers. So uh, this gives them a little bit more of a, a window to get back to business as usual before they, ha they have to worry about facing the same type of application from the union. Um, so Dan, I'll turn it over to you to talk a little bit about remedial certification. Okay, and the remedial certification jumps off from where Dan uh, discussed about the certification. So um, by way of background, remedial certification is an automatic certification uh, ordered by the board where the normal democratic voting requirement is no longer required. Um, and the board will in the past and, and still, the, the board has the opportunity to order um, automatic certification if it finds that the board, sorry, if it finds that the employer has done something where the democratic process is tainted, where the board no longer believes that the uh, employees can exercise their free will. Um, so the previous amendments ma made it a, a lot easier to get automatic uh, or remedial certification. Um, and to the surprise of some, uh, the current government has, has left the remedial certification in, in the act or in the code, I should say. However, it's put some uh, restrictions. It's put some criteria that need to be met before um, remedial certification will be available. And it's important because at the end of the day, you don't want to take away employees' democratic right to vote. You don't want to leave it up to the union or employer. You want to leave it up to the employees themselves. So in terms of the conditions, uh, there's two. Uh, there must be determination by the board that a representation vote does not reflect the true wishes of the employees in the unit because of a employer action, a prohibited practice. And second, automatic certification, remedial certification can be issued only if no other remedy or remedies would be sufficient to counteract the effects of a prohibited practice. So um, what, we, what we anticipate seeing is if an employer does something bad and is found guilty to have done something, terminated an employee who is a supporter of the union, which then arguably chills the union drive, the employer will likely argue hey, if we've done something bad, which we don't think we have, um, this can be remedied by doing a new vote or allowing the union to come in and have a meeting with our employees. So there's different steps to remedy it. We don't have to go to the nuclear option of doing this uh, remedial certification. Um, in short, remedial certification is now a remedy of, of last resort, which under the uh, previous regime, it, it wasn't that case. All right, uh, next, I wanna talk a little bit about collective agreement renewals. And to understand the changes that have been introduced here, you need to understand a bit of the background in, of how open periods work. Um, so uh, we've been talking about the fact that uh, it's a democratic process by which uh, unions become bargaining agents in most cases. Um, but as with any democratic uh, process, uh, there needs to be you know, an opportunity to have a, a vote every so often to change your mind as to who you would like to 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 represent you, or in a in a uh, in other elections, who you want to run your government and so forth. So, it's a similar concept here. Um, the idea is is that once a, a union becomes certified, they should have some protection against getting ousted, and the employer should have a period of stability where it's not a revolving door of unions. Um, uh, competing with each other to represent employees or employees uh, attempting to oust the union. So to provide a period of stability, um, there's certain periods in which um, unions can't organize. Now, if an employer's uh, non-union, they're in what we would call open season all the time. Uh, any union can apply at any point in time to become bargaining agent. Uh, once a union gets certified, they get a window of protection to try and secure a collective agreement. Now, if they secure a collective agreement, um, there is no ability to apply 
for certification. That is, uh, other unions don't have that uh, ability and employees don't have the ability to try and remove the bargaining agent um, until certain open periods arise. Those open periods are tied to the collective agreement once it's in place. So uh, usually in the last two months of a collective agreement, and if it's a collective agreement that's longer than uh, 32 months, there's going to be an open period in the middle of in the middle of that collective agreement as well. So with that long background in mind, um, what the new legislation will do is it will give um, employers uh, and unions the ability to close those open periods with the blessing of employees. The theory being that if uh, everyone is happy, uh, all three parties, that being the uh, employer union and the employees, um, why shouldn't the employees be able to make an informed decision to stick with their bargaining agent uh, rather than uh, uh, inviting in an, another union? And that provides employers with protection against the uh, disruption uh, that occurs with raids. So, um, uh, under the old legislation, uh, that was something that could not occur. Uh, there was a Labor Relations Board decision a number of years ago that said that uh, from a policy perspective, we just think it's important to have a periodic open period no matter what. Well, this legislation uh, takes more of a, uh, I'd say, common sense and practical approach to say, as long as consent is informed, employees can, can waive those open periods. So if you're, for example, if you're coming up uh, at the end of a collective agreement, uh, and normally there'd be an open period in the last two months, before that open period uh, commences, the employer and the union could negotiate a new collective agreement uh, for another two or three year period. Um, the union, if that occurs, can take it to the employees and say, um, will you ratify this collective agreement? And just so you know, if you ratify this agreement, you will also be closing that uh, open period. You will be preventing yourself the opportunity to bring in another union or to uh, remove, remove us as your bargaining agent. And if it's presented to employees in that fashion and they ratify a collective agreement, well, then you can have a, a renewal in advance of the open period. And it uh, essentially shuts the door on that open period. Uh, and the legislation also requires any other union that has an interest in the matter, if they're going to challenge uh, that early renewal, they need to do it um, before the expiry of that open period that's been closed by the early renewal. Um, so that's uh, something that we expect to come in, in 2021. Dan, uh, back to you in first contract arbitration. Yeah, so what we see is, you know, there's a theme to these amendments. Let's reduce the board's involvement in matters, and let's try to maintain labor harmony. Um, and so this is the, uh, works on the former situation, trying to reduce red tape, trying to reduce uh, the board's involvement. So first contract arbitration, uh, it's a statutory mechanism that allows either party in unsuccessful collective bargaining uh, negotiations. So you have uh, a union come in, the uh, employees uh, vote and decide they want that union. The next step is to, to for the parties, the union and the employer to get together and try to negotiate a collective agreement. So this mechanism is available uh, where the union and employer can't negotiate an agreement. Um, and so this helps negotiate that first collective agreement. Um, however, uh, a change, an important change is the legislation restricts for when, uh, when you can have this uh, this first contract arbitration. Um, there's a couple of criteria. The board must be satisfied that arbitration is necessary, that the parties can't deal with it by themselves. The employer or trade union, as the case may be, must have committed an unfair labor practice. Um, and we have that on the slide. So if there must be some wrongdoing that's led to the requirement for arbitration, refusal to meet, uh, refusal to recognize the other party as an exclusive bargaining agent, a failure to make a reasonable effort to conclude an agreement. So there is some bargaining requirements in labor law that uh, that must be met. And so if one party's offside, that will give a reason or justification for the board to make the order. 
And, and lastly, again, uh, as we saw with remedial certification, no other remedy or remedies would be sufficient to counteract the effects of the unfair, unfair labor practice. So if there's wrongdoing, the board's going to try to figure out, well, how else can we address this without, without having these parties come to arbitration um, and have a, effectively an agreement foisted on them? Um, so uh, it's still a tool, still a mechanism if parties can't get to can't get along and can't get agreement. However, there's some hoops, there's some requirements that must be met uh, before the board will step in and, and, and order that. Uh, next, uh, in, a, in this kind of dovetails with the last slide, there's enhanced mediation. Uh, the enhanced mediation process though, was introduced recently by the board uh, and is now specifically referenced in, in the act or in the code, I should say as a precondition to holding certain events, including that of a holding a strike or a lockout. So if you do enhance mediation um, and you, you then have the cooling off period, the parties will be in a position to, uh, to have a strike or lockout. Uh, this change isn't so much groundbreaking, but it simply clarifies that enhanced mediation satisfies the mediation requirement in order to get a strike or lockout vote. It's one of those steps. And now we have another step or another alternative uh, before we parties can go vote and decide if they want to have a strike or lockout. Thank you, Dan. Um, there's also some changes um, that are, that have been made to, and have already started to be, some of them have already been implemented with respect to tightening up uh, picketing. So we're talking, picketing is something the board can uh, regulate in all in a lawful dispute. So even if uh, the parties uh, have reached the point where they're in, at a lawful strike or lawful lockout, um, there still has to be some rules of engagement around picketing. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, that picketing has to be uh, lawful. Uh, and picketing can be an unlawful in a number of different ways. And what this legislation does is it tries to uh, tighten that up a little bit and make sure that uh, picketing, which is at its heart, it's about trying to persuade. Uh, you're out there trying to persuade, uh, if you're on a picket line trying to persuade workers not to cross, uh, you're trying to persuade the public not to support the employer's cause and so forth, uh, trying to persuade the public to support your cause. Um, when it goes beyond that, uh, it becomes problematic. And there often are these games uh, played essentially where picketing is is intended to obstruct. Uh, it's designed to, to try and stop uh, the employer from being able to get um, replacement workers in. Uh, it's designed to, to try and grind the employer's operations to a halt so that the um, bargaining agent gains leverage that way. So. Um, if that's going to happen, it, it needs to happen lawfully. So one thing that's one clear change that's helpful for employers is that uh, they've there's an express provision in the code now that says obstructing or impeding someone who's trying to cross a picket line, that's unlawful. Um, and that will be helpful uh, because in the past, uh, the Labor Relations Board has uh, has issued decisions and, and through their mediations, they've encouraged the parties to agree to protocols that allow um, uh, picketing to stop individuals for two, three, four, five, six, seven minutes, each individual trying to cross a picket line and uh, they don't have seven minutes of content uh, to try and persuade the person. All they're doing is trying to create the longest line uh, and blockade entrances and, and stop people from getting across and that sort of thing. So this clarifies that that sort of thing uh, should not be permitted. Um, the second thing uh, that the new legislation will do is it will put some parameters around uh, the places where picketing can go. It can it can happen at the primary place of employment, but if you're but if picketing is going to occur at other places, say an employer shifts production to another place, uh, or they're picketing at the employer's other operations, or an ally of the employer in the sense that this is someone who has um, is, is helping supply the uh, employer uh, and help them get get through the strike. If you're going to strike at those places now. Uh, that's what we call secondary picketing and all of that 
uh, picketing now needs to go through the board in that uh, an application needs to be made and the uh, uh, and the board needs to be satisfied that there's good reason for picketing to be taking place there and they can set parameters around that sort of picketing. Um, next, we want to talk a little bit about um, remedies for illegal strikes and lockouts. So what I was talking about before is the picketing that uh, traditionally takes uh, takes place during uh, legal strikes and, and legal walkouts. Uh, the board uh, is also called upon on many occasions to uh, put an end to what we would call an illegal work stoppage and that's a, um, a, a work stoppage that occurs prematurely either before the end of a collective agreement or before all the preliminary steps uh, under the code that are designed to make sure that strikes and lockouts are used really as a last resort after the parties have attempted to uh, negotiate and mediate and so forth. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Dan. Yeah, so just just touching again on remedies for legal strikes. So it, it's timely to talk about what a legal or unlawful strike is. Obviously, it was in the news and, and just to reinforce what Dan said, it's where you have a strike that you haven't gone through the appropriate steps to get there. So you, you need a collective agreement that's uh, expired. You need the parties to enter mediation. You need the cooling off period to occur. You need a strike vote. So unless you jump through all the steps, then you don't have a, a legal strike. Um, and, you know, just, just a little bit timely, obviously, with the, some of the issues in, in healthcare care and, and other labor issues across the province. So in terms of remedies for legal strikes and lockouts, uh, the ability for the board to suspend and the deduction and remittance of union dues in cases of legal strikes has been added back in or reestablished under labor relations code. So for those of you who don't operate in the unionized sector, um, as part of the employer's responsibility, it has to take union dues from each employee's paycheck and remit it back to the union. And that's how the union um, operates. And so if there's an illegal strike, uh, the employer can make an application or it does not have to, does not have to remit those dues. Uh, the suspension may continue for one to six months, so it could be a considerable amount of time and a considerable amount of money, which creates a financial reason for the union to not support the legal activity. Um, and this is just an important financial consequence for legal strike activities that the parties cannot contract out of. Uh, in the case of an illegal lockout where the employer hasn't gone through the necessary steps to lock out employees, um, for instance, if there's a collective agreement in place and mediation hasn't occurred, there's no lockout vote. Uh, the legislation allows an, an order for the employer to pay union dues, assessments, and other fees payable uh, during that period. So just because the employer is locked out doesn't mean it uh, can get away with not paying um, the union the monies that the union uh, is right, rightfully entitled to. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, there's also some changes uh, that have been made to the reverse onus provisions of the code. So. Uh, this really relates to unfair labor practices. So there's, uh, by unfair labor practices, we mean um, the list of uh, rules under the labor relations code that employers shall not do this, uh, unions shall not do this. Um, and typically, uh, or a common area uh, that these sort of things relate to is an employer taking some sort of action against an employee, whether it being discipline, termination, uh, or something else that's designed to intimidate, coerce, or have undue influence on the employee's decision as to whether they're going to support a union, whether they're going to take part in lawful union activities, uh, and so forth. So um, what the NDP regime had done uh, was followed the lead of some other jurisdictions in creating this reverse onus um, in situations where uh, the employer is accused of doing something for an un unlawful purpose or unlawful motivation. So, um, for example, the the discipline of an employee is alleged to be tainted by this motivation to discourage them from supporting the union. Um, the theory as to why a reverse onus is necessary is that, you know, the motivation, uh, the reason why the employer doing this is something that's uniquely within the employer's knowledge. So um, the union or the employee should only have to, to prove that uh, there's been 
discipline or or action taken in certain circumstances where um, it's apparent that union activity is taking place. And if they do that, then the onus switches to the employer to show that that termination or that uh, discipline or what have you was not motivated in any way uh, by uh, the union activity. So there's this presumption against the employer in these circumstances and um, the onus is actually quite high on the employer to show that not only is there a credible and reasonable explanation um, uh, as to why they took that action, but it has absolutely nothing to do with uh, the union activity or the employees union leanings and that sort of thing. So uh, it's a difficult situation to find yourself as an employer when you face one of those complaints. This new legislation doesn't uh, take that onus away, uh, but it restricts the type of complaints that it can relate to. Uh, and it really narrows, narrows the reverse onus to those situations where an employee has been terminated. The other thing it does is it sort of evens the ledger. It, if the reverse onus is going to apply against employers, it should also apply against unions when they've been alleged to have taken action against a member uh, in, in an effort to intimidate or coerce them into union membership or for to, to not participate in the activities of another union or, or what have you. Uh, because again, uh, the same reasoning should apply there as to the need for the reverse onus. So they've uh, expanded it to apply to unions as well. Um, and other than that, um, when you're dealing with these complaints, the other thing you need to know, um, document production is something that still can be produced or can still be ordered by the board in advance of an actual hearing. So sometimes you get into this uh, situation where it's not clear the union has uh, you know, uh, provided enough particulars for the employer to adequately respond to this thing and they and they start seeking documents and that sort of thing on a bit of a fishing expedition. So um, the, the lay of the land is still the same there. The law hasn't changed. There is the ability for the board to order that in appropriate circumstances, but they need to, sh to strike the right balance to make sure that the employer's got a, uh, a valid footing from which they're seeking document production. Um, Dan, back over to you. Yeah, uh, moving to summary dismissal. One, one thing that Dan mentioned about having credible, reasonable explanation. So one thing us lawyers look for is you know, when a client comes to us, is that, well, give us that performance evaluation. Give us all those disciplinary letters that came up before uh, the, uh, the certification application happened. So we can say that this is the reason this termination has been in the works for some time and it's completely unrelated to uh, uh, being related to anti-union animus or something like that. So that's the information. We always like documentation for us being able to find that saying, look, this decision came about before we knew of the union is really helpful for us. So keep your documents, have, have a good document management or control system. Uh, summary dismissal. Uh, this change just simply expanded the board power to dismiss applications filed with improper motives or where there's an abusive process that language has been added in. Just another mechanism for the board and Dan alluded to it earlier. The board's incredibly busy uh, at the best of times and is busy now and dealing with all sorts of complaints related to COVID. Um, obviously, um, there's uh, labor issues because of the poor market. And so this is just another arrow in the quiver of the parties and the board to dismiss matters that are frivolous or, or don't have legs or are done for improper reasons. Just another codification of, of that ability. So uh, helpful for the board, helpful for all parties, a union and management would like to, to get rid of those complaints that take up a lot of time, a lot of resources, and to deal with the really important matters. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, another area that uh, the government has followed the lead of other jurisdictions is with respect to union discipline. And at the, at the root of uh, an employee's right to unionize is really the, the more, fundament, more fundamental right in some respects to earn a livelihood. That's the purpose of joining a, a trade union is to further your career uh, and to earn a livelihood. And um, labor, uh, legislation in other provinces and other labor boards have recognized that sometimes that requires dual uh, unionism uh, or employees that need to belong to more than one uh, union. Uh, you can think about the construct 
construction industry as being the primary example of this. You've got traditional uh, building trade unions, and then you've got uh, uh, you know open shop, non-union workplaces, and you've got alternative union workplaces. You can also think of employees who have part-time employment and need to be members of multiple unions for that purpose. So, um, uh, the this these changes are, are designed to to protect that right and to make sure that unions are only operating in truly defensive uh, ways if they're going to punish someone for taking a job, uh, whether that's taking a job with a, uh, a non-union employer or taking a job with uh, a employer who has a relationship with another union. So um, if, a, if a union is going to discipline a, a member for that reason, uh, there's more uh, tightened restrictions in place now uh, that they need to uh, be able to uh, satisfy the board of if they're if they're challenged on that and and one thing is they need to to show that they truly are acting in a defensive measure and what the employee is doing is really a, a threat to the institution of the union itself in some in some way and secondly uh, in fairness to the employee, if you're going to discipline an employee for taking a, uh, or a member for taking a job elsewhere, um, you should be able to demonstrate that you're able to provide that member with work opportunities and that they're, you know, they're cherry picking job opportunities um, and supporting someone else rather than, uh, than uh, that particular union. So uh, if the union is not able to do that, if they don't have any uh, work available, and if it's not comparable, uh, then they can't discipline the member for doing that. And this legislation expands um, on the notion of what's comparable employment and really talks about the fact that if someone's just trying to advance their career and they step outside of the bargaining unit into a managerial position, um, uh, it's not really comparable for the union to say, yeah, we can put you back on the tools uh, and we expect you to give up that sort of career advancement. Um, so that's one change. And the other thing uh, that's done is to make sure that they're comparing apples to apples. If the union is punishing someone for working in a different industry, that doesn't make a lot of sense. They're not offering comparable employment unless they're able to offer a job in the same industry. So those uh, are welcome changes for employees uh, in that, uh, particularly in, in these times, you have to do what you have to do to, to get by and to make sure you're putting food on the table. Um, and uh, this change makes sure that unions aren't acting in a punitive or retaliatory manner and that they are, you know, acting with, in a principled manner and only acting as a last resort to protect uh, their interests when need be. And to a large extent, I think this, those amendments correct some of the case law that was out there in terms of when, it, when a union could find their, their members. And, and just by way of background, unions have constitutions and bylaws, and it's often in those constitutions that allow um, the unions to uh, put penalties or fees against its membership. And, and sometimes, in our firm's experience, and to me in particular, going down and trying to defend a union I, sorry, defend an employee against an accusation, and it's very much a kangaroo court. There's no rules of evidence. It's almost like you, sh you show up and, the, and there's a judge, jury, and executioner all in one. And basically, if you've been hit with a warning or hit with a, an allegation, you know you're going to be hit with a, a penalty. And these penalties are substantial. I faced We faced one where there was two penalties of $15,000. So $30,000 against an employee. And at that point, the employee needs to make a decision. Do I stay with the union and pay that? crazy amount of money or do I go non-union for the rest of my life because the only way I can get membership back is to pay that fee and so um, hopefully these changes uh, address that uh, and we don't have ourselves before the kangaroo court uh, too often. Um, you have anything else to add on that Dan? No that uh, that covers it. Okay so uh, another change uh, uh, under the uh, the changes that have been ushered in, the power of an arbitrator to relieve against grievance time limits and introduced by the last government is now removed. Also removed is a provision of the LRC, the Labor Relations Code, requiring arbitrators to make decisions in accordance with principles of Canadian labor arbitration. And, and Dan and I actually uh, discussed this about how this plays out. And ultimately, at the end of the day, arbitrators are guided by legislation, or sorry, guided by case law from other provinces. And this now allows us to focus purely on Alberta case law or uh, 
uh, case law that comes up the Supreme Court of Canada. At the end of the day, we still expect other uh, arbitration decisions from other provinces to be used, but now we're not bound by it. And this explicitly clarifies that because Alberta is unique in terms of uh, the economy we have. It's unique in terms of the working conditions and we shouldn't be beholden to other jurisdictions. So this just clarifies that a little bit. Not to say we can't use other provinces uh, case law, uh, but uh, arbitrators will no longer be beholden to that uh, uh, case law. Um, just skipping ahead to review of arbitration awards. So um, the Labor Relations Board is empowered to review arbitral decisions. Um, by way of background, we're in a unionized sector um, there is a dispute between the management and the employer and the union. Um, if the parties can't agree uh, or settle that matter, it can be escalated through different levels of grievance, eventually culminates in an arbitration. Um, and if the parties uh, dispute the arbitration decision, that goes to the board. So um, this now just uh, changes the, the process uh, for those reviews of those arbitration uh, decisions. Um, and specifically changes the standard of review that the board will have in, in looking at the arbitration decision. Um, importantly, uh, it, before the board, before amendments were ushered in where the board can review the arbitration decision, those decisions have to go to the court. Um, now, obviously, they, they go to the board and when the matters were before the court, the parties could seek costs. And so that change has now been implemented uh, into the board, uh, the board's authority to order costs. So we're very interested to see what the board is going to do in terms of awarding costs because um, there's a lot of time and there's a lot of money at stake and, and for the successful party, they should be able to recoup some of that. So uh, keep your eyes and ears posted. You know, when we catch wind of what the board's doing, we'll definitely be updating our client base and, and the public at large in terms of that information. Thanks, Dan. The legislation also uh, introduces a number of changes for the construction industry. I'm just going to touch on those very briefly. One of the things that it does is it, uh, it creates the ability for um, workforces to be organized on an all employee basis in the construction and, and maintenance industries. Uh, so the board's policy has been to, to have uh, certification occur on a trade by trade basis, which follows sort of the traditional building trade lines. Electricians, you need a, a separate certificate for all electricians, uh, carpenters, plumbers and pipe fitters and so on. Um, and uh, even if it was a union uh, who's not subject to registration, such as CLAC or someone else like that, who is, uh, who is able to organize employees uh, across all, all uh, trades and enters into a collective agreement uh, eventually with the employer for all trades and all employees, uh, they would have to get certified on a trade by trade by trade basis. Now, this legislation will allow them just to apply for an all employee unit, uh, which is uh, a welcome change for employers and would streamline that process. There's also um, some added flexibility for the building trades to enter into um, multi uh, multi-trade project agreement. So um, the Building Trades of Alberta, uh, the governing organization now has the ability to, to negotiate directly with employers for project specific agreements and terms and conditions. Um, and then if uh, two or more uh, building trade unions sign on to that uh, and the employer is signed on to it, it becomes a project agreement that's binding on everyone. So it gives uh, more flexibility to the building trades and to employers to um, work outside the parameters of the registration agreements, which uh, again uh, is sort of a one size fits all agreement. So this gives um, uh, some welcome flexibility to employers and project owners to make sure that they're able to uh, to move forward on, on projects effectively. Um, and then there's some added flexibility given around uh, uh, what we call division eight major projects. Uh, and again, these are, these are changes that are ultimately designed to encourage more investment in Alberta. If someone's going to uh, invest the billions of dollars necessary for a major project, uh, they want to be assured that they can um, execute on that project uh, and do it in a uh, efficient and timely manner. And uh, the provisions are really just designed to make sure that uh, project owners are able to, to dictate that project agreements for those types of projects are, um, 
uh, are dealt with uh, up front and uh, give them uh, the comfort of knowing that there's going to be stability throughout the life of the project. Um, and those are the major changes uh, to the construction industry that we're going to see moving forward. Um, and uh, Dan, um, there's also some changes on union finances. Uh, why don't you uh, explain what those are? Yeah, so the, so the next two slides will deal with union finances in, in general. Uh, consistent with what we're seeing uh, in terms of legislative trends uh, towards greater financial disclosure of public entities and corporations, uh, there are now new requirements upon unions to provide members with an annual uh, financial statement uh, free of charge and within a reasonable amount of time. So at the end of the day, union member, you're paying dues, uh, you ought to know what your union is doing and that just, this now codifies that requirement that the union has to provide those financial statements. Um, in order to enforce those rights, the member can now make a complaint to the board that they haven't been provided uh, with the financial statements or haven't been provided with those in a timely fashion. So um, at the end of the day, transparency, that would be the buzzword used. This adds for transparency. Um, and this kind of dovetails with the next slide in terms of union dues. Um, this change is, is, is quite significant. Um, there's, there's a lot of upheaval in, in the union world in terms of this, but at the end of the day, the government has introduced a requirement for workers or an ability for workers to opt out to the payment of union dues unrelated to core activities. So if it's related to core activities, defending uh, employees, collective bargaining, grievance, arbitration, all that good labor relation work, then you can opt out of it. But when it comes to those ancillary or secondary tasks that unions often do, um, political campaigns or support of social causes, you now as a member subject to proclamation um, have an ability to opt out because if you don't agree with the political, political leaning of your union, uh, you now have a, a right not to have your money spent to support that, uh, that political party, for example. Um, so in short, workers are no longer required to support non-core activities. There's also been some changes to the duty of uh, fair representation sections of the code, and really it relates to how the board deals with those. Uh, the board gets an awful lot of those. If you looked at just the volume of the uh, uh, volume of the applications and complaints that the, the board receives, the largest volume of those are these uh, complaints by employees who have, who are alleging that their union hasn't represented them fairly. And those complaints impact the employer because the board has the right to do certain things like extend the time limits to file a grievance. They can order the union to advance a grievance to arbitration. Um, so you could have a matter that you think is behind you and resolved and suddenly uh, through one of these uh, complaints, you're dealing with an arbitration again. So um, uh, the changes that have been introduced um, are really designed to give the, the board some more tools to deal with these efficiently and effectively. And really, um, there's a lot of them that aren't merited that, and need to be dismissed summarily. So a couple of years ago, the board was given the power to uh, do a paper review initially. And if it on paper is clearly without merit, they can dismiss it at that stage. And if not, then they can order a hearing uh, to, to proceed. Um, these latest changes, um, give the, the board another tool to get rid of these complaints. Uh, and that is, uh, if a reasonable offer has been made, the board can say, it doesn't make sense for us to go spend the resources, um, on, spend the resources on a hearing uh, when uh, the union has made a, a reasonable offer to the employee and the employer has given its blessing to, to the effect, to the to the extent that it impacts the employer. Um, and that allows, uh, that should allow moving forward, uh, the board to take a very similar approach that the Human Rights Commission has taken. So under the Alberta Human Rights Act, uh, the board has, the uh, Human Rights Commission has the power to do just that. If a reasonable and fair offer has been made and refused by the complainant, uh, they can say we're, not, we're going to uh, uh, discontinue the the process at this point. And uh, the changes under the Labor Code pick up on that language and uh, I imagine as it gets rolled out it'll be a very similar process. And our hope is that uh, they take a look at what's reasonable and fair from a global perspective 
and, and are not just dealing with the cases on the margins where something's been offered that uh, uh, would, you know, satisfy the employees uh, uh, in, you know, the wildest dreams if they were to achieve ultimate success on every score in a in an action. Hopefully, there's some broader look at. Uh, you know, the litigation risk involved for the employee and so forth. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see on, on uh, whether they provide some, some better guidelines as to how that will be uh, applied. Uh, but that should be helpful. And uh, just to conclude, uh, just a quick reminder as to some of the things that really haven't changed. As uh, Dan and I have walked you through, uh, remedial certification, first contract arbitration and reverse onus, those are remnants from the NDP changes that have stayed. Uh, what has happened is those provisions have been tightened up and narrowed uh, so that they're used less frequently. Uh, the marshalling provisions, uh, which were introduced a few years ago, were largely seen as positive changes those provisions allow the board to make sure that employers aren't dealing with uh, multiple proceedings, uh, parallel proceedings at the same time. So do you have a, do you have a grievance uh, and you've got a human rights complaint and you've got something else? Well, uh, the labor board's got the ability to look through some of that and say, okay, all of these aren't going ahead at once. Uh, let's have the grievance go ahead first and then we'll put everything else on hold, for example. So they've got a way to streamline process that way. So that's helpful. That's still around. The requirement for employers and unions to file their collective agreements with the board is, is still there. Uh, the, the statutory freeze or protection that a union gets after certification, uh, that window of opportunity to bargain a new to bargain a first collective agreement with the employer is still there. Um, and uh, the board and arbitrator powers haven't really been restricted uh, a lot through these new changes. Um, uh, the, the application of the board to dependent contractors uh, still applies. So the labor code still applies to dependent contractors. Um, there's still no restriction on the ability of unions to plant uh, organizers uh, at an employer's uh, business for the purpose of, uh, of organizing. So that's what we would call salting. Uh, that, that is still uh, permissible. And there's still some unique provisions for remote work sites where uh, if, a, if a union can demonstrate to the board that they need uh, access uh, for the purposes of uh, employees exercising their rights to organize and so forth. Well, then uh, in those uh, certain circumstances, remote access to the workplace or the work site can be granted by the board. Um, and uh, this last slide is just a list of uh, some other changes. Dan uh, spoke about uh, some changes coming in the regulations to averaging agreements and so forth. Well, um, through regulation, uh, the you know the government has given itself more power to to make future changes by regulation. Uh, they've um, dealt with some post-secondary uh, bargaining issues. Uh, they've changed, tweaked the preamble. So they've done some other things as well. Um, but uh, we've covered off all the major changes. Um, we thank you very much for sticking with us uh, through the lunch hour and beyond here. We hope you found this to be uh, informative. And uh, as we promised at the beginning, if you've got some uh, questions about some of the specific changes and how they might apply to your organization, feel free to uh, pass those along and we'll do our best to get back to you with some, some answers to help you navigate these changes as you move forward in uh, what is really a, a difficult time, but we see some light at the end of, end of the tunnel here, which we're all thankful for. And it's, uh, uh, I think, very important for all our spirits going into this holiday to see some, some better times ahead. Uh, we just need to keep moving forward and uh, stay the course and uh, we'll get there eventually. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Dan and Dan. Um, like you said, we just got to keep moving and stay the course um, to, to see this through. Um, I think everybody's a little bit excited with the vaccine landing and hopefully uh, be back to what 
what we're more used to and a cup and um what we all all like is seeing each other um so thank you both uh dan and dan for your time today um any questions at all um so there's dan uh, both dan's um contact information there so if you want you can write that down or screenshot that um any questions at all um even if you're kind of mulling all of this over tonight um or through the rest of the week if you've got questions um email us here at the chamber or either dan bokenfort or dan weber there um whichever one might be able to answer your question better uh, I do see one question here coming from Leanne. So Leanne is with the Spruce Grove Public Library. And uh, Leanne says, can you explain who is exempt from overtime due to their high, from overtime due to their high level in the organization? Yeah, so I think that's set out in the regulations. So it's those employees who have a managerial or supervisory function or those employees who have uh, access to confidential information and, and the way the employment standards has interpreted it is this confidential information doesn't pertain to financial so much as confidential employee information or labor relations information so your human resource uh, practitioners would generally fall under that so the exception is managerial supervisory or confidential information and then there's a whole series of other exceptions depending on your profession, for example, and to the chagrin of many, uh, lawyers are exempted out of uh, overtime allowances. So lawyers don't get overtime, architects, um, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so if you're looking at supervisor or manager beyond, you're typically not talking about a um, acting supervisor, you know, on on shift is, is doing the same work as everyone else, but is the, uh, the person taking the lead and that sort of thing. It's usually requires some managerial uh, oversight beyond that or supervisory oversight where your job is supervisor or manager and that's what you're doing. You're not doing the frontline work uh, as your primary responsibility. You're, you're looking after other employees and typically responsible for not only, you know, telling them what to, what to do during their particular shift and how to do it, but also you're responsible for things like uh, involvement in discipline or involvement in hiring and uh, and uh, firing and that sort of thing. So um, that's that's uh, as brief of an explanation as we can give of the divi dividing line. Perfect. Thank you. I think that does help um, help clear it up a little bit. Any other questions? There is the the Q and A box. Um, or if you have something quick, if you want, you can send it into the chat. Um, if not, um, anybody at the chamber can get you in touch um, with with either of these guys here, or um, this will be saved uh, and sent to you all afterwards with the, the slide deck as well as the video. Um, so I think that's about it. I don't see any more coming in. So I'm just going to wrap things up here, get everybody back to uh, their regular scheduled afternoon. So um, thank you everybody for joining us here today. Um, I appreciate you all taking the time to, to come and hang out with us. Um, oh, Leanne has a follow-up question, which she will email. So um, sure. she'll get that off to either of you shortly. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so everybody is, we're going into the Christmas break and stuff here. Just a reminder, uh, we'll be sending this information out as well, but the chamber office is going to be closed, uh, Christmas Eve, December 24th until, um, January 4th when we're back in the office that, that Monday morning. Um, and as always, we always encourage everybody to shop local. We've got our 25 days of sales going on. So keep an eye out for the rest of those for the rest of the month. They go all the way up until Christmas Eve. Um, I wish everybody a happy new year and a very um, hopefully relaxing uh, Christmas break. So thank you again, Dan and Dan, and uh, we'll see you guys later. Thanks a lot. Thank you.